that's not for you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. I feel like you're saying it's just, it's just for Will. <laughs> that wasn't um, sound effects, by the way. They're real claps. Real Mark, people. Real claps. Because look, yeah. we've got just under, I think it's about 850, we counted before, 850 people down here at Seven Brothers in Salford. In the shadows, John Wilkin. In the, it sounds romantic, doesn't it? In the shadows of Old Trafford. It is. Um, oh, the Matt Busby stand you're, you're not far away. You're always lurking around in the shadows, aren't you? I've been in the shadows for 37 people, years. Yeah. people, seeing what's I mean, going I'm on. I'm still in the shadows. Have you ever heard um, 800 people clap before? Uh, well, we did Mark, We did your testimonial mm. recently, didn't we? Mm. Down at, uh, well, where can we was just it? get a round can, of applause let's again? Let's listen to that again. Is that just eight? for 800 yeah. people, this is what it yeah. sounds like. That's it. That's more like 900, I think. That's more like 900, yeah. It's more like 900. It's about 850, 900, but we're, we're, who's counting? Um, and look who we're joined by, Mark. I mean, we've got rid of one sexy motherfucker. They're good looking boys, these two guests yeah. we've had, aren't they? Well, the probable league players. Jérôme Guisset, on peut faire tout le port en français. Si tu veux, comme ça, il n'y a personne qui comprend le reste. C'est ce que j'attendais depuis depuis tout à l'heure que je suis assis ici, j'attends qu'on parle français. On, personne on fait juste les deux, comme ça, les personnes. Tout le monde ferme sa gueule. 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 Um, look, uh, your accent firstly fascinates me. Before we get onto Catalan and everything that you've been up to, because there's a bit, there's a bit of an Australian twang in there, isn't there? From your time in Canberra, there's a kind of obviously the French side. There's a bit of Warrington, a bit of Wigan. There's a bit of it. It's a lovely little mix. I'm not sure where it's from. Mate. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually lost myself. Uh, I can't. I think my wife still uh, still believes that I'm like out of nowhere. Like, there's something that's kind of followed me over the last twenty years or so. Is it Mrs. English. Mrs. English, yeah. yeah. It's from Warrington, so hence the reason why I'm here still. Uh, yeah. But yeah, fa it still fascinates me, that accent. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I want to talk to you about, but obviously you were born in Perpignan. So, yeah. I mean, ju just, I mean, sort of set the scene of what it's like growing up there. And rugby league Perpignan isn't the obvious kind of go to is it and i know rugby league is big in the southwest of france and obviously the further north you get it's more football and so on but what was it like growing up there and and how did i, I always ask this question it is a cliche question but it, we always get great answers how did rugby league come into your life when, yeah, when you were a kid it's a good question like like to a lot of people obviously perpignan is is um is the dragons is 2006 first year in super league and we've been around now like for what is it 15 years um a lot of people forget that Perpignan, like rugby league has been Perpignan for over 90 years. Uh, I think the club was formed in, in the 30s um, or so forth. Rugby union was there like for a long, long time. So there's always been like rugby roots around Perpignan and, and there's always been rugby there and rugby is a dom dominant sport. Um, but rugby union has always had the strongest hold. Uh, there's been like periods, like golden periods for rugby league, uh, like a, around the decades or, or so, but rugby union has always been the biggest sport. So when you're at school growing up, you always talk about rugby, uh, rugby union that is. Um, it's only like a few villages that you play rugby league. Uh, that was the case for me. Uh, my my family is actually more of a rugby union route. Um, no football talking about there or when I was young, like football was only like, you watch TV, you watch the French side play. That's about it. There's no, there's no football uh, clubs around. It was a good around. French side, to be fair, when you were yeah, growing up. Yeah, it's pretty good. World Cup winners, 99. <laughs> pretty good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we spoiled, like, obviously, we spoiled now with, with football. But growing up, you had to decide whether you play rugby or you don't do any other sports. At, at my age, that's what it was. Um, I was fortunate enough to move to a village that had rugby league. Uh, and I took it up. I had no idea what rugby league was. Um, it was on TV. So you played union in school? Because obviously uh, you played for Brief at the end of your career. Union, yeah, didn't I did. You? Yeah, yeah, I did a little bit. Did a bit of union. Um, I'm not scared to say that that wasn't the game for me. Um, mm. But I just, yeah. I, what was the village called? The Santa Esteva. Right. Well, that's, Santa yeah, Santa yeah. Esteva is my... That's, that's and, what, and why I'm interested, why such specific areas you know mm. like a really small you know when you talk about rugby league's played in a town yeah. or a city or yeah i'm, I'm it's played, it's played in 90 years the history of rugby league. well, well, played, well yeah, there's a massive history with with french uh, yeah. rugby league in france and political well the, v and the vici government banned rugby league didn't Correct. they yeah, so the yeah. so rugby union was allowed to sort of proliferate yeah. because of a political agenda where yeah. the Vichy government made it illegal to yeah, play rugby the league. Yeah, they banned it like completely. That could be that could have been a turning point because at that time, like rugby league was on the up, like massive up. Um, you're talking like sellout stadium, like obviously like twenty thousand at the time. There was no TV, obviously, yeah, so yeah, yeah. stadium were filled up. 
and and they kind of it was a massive shot in the like massive shot in the wing like everything went down like for about five or six years I think the whole duration of the Second World War so there was no rugby league um, rugby league came back into it for for a good period for about twenty years um, I think they made two World Cup finals sixty eight and seventy. Yes, yeah. in the seventies. <laughs> in the seventies, <laughs> something starting with seven. Uh, so there was some like some really golden moments. I think, I think obviously, um, one of the things that we never had in France was um, in the period of success, and that's what we discussed earlier. Mm. I think that there was no one to grab the game by the balls and say this is where we go next. So there was no real vision. The only person uh, in my eyes that has got the vision. Nowadays, it's Bernard Gouache. Hence the reason why the Dragons are where they are. Mm. Uh, and I know I've gotten like quite a lot from, from what I said from, from the earlier question, but I think that rugby league, um, especially in France, and we talked about it in England, mm. um, but obviously in England, it's an English sport. It's in the culture. Um, in France, you haven't got the luxury. So for anyone that touches rugby league, Anyone that gets converted to rugby league, within two weeks, I'll tell you, it's the best game in the world. I know tons of people that never knew what rugby league was. They watch a game and you get addicted, like literally addicted. That happened to me and happened to a lot of my friends. However, I think that there's a... It becomes a microcosm. Like You end up being in your own tribe where you think that this is the best game in the world, but you don't want to shout out about it. And I think that obviously one of the reasons why rugby league at the moment, in France anyway, um, is so small compared to all a lot of other sports is, is because you haven't got that driving force to say, listen, this is what's going to happen next. Obviously, there's budget issues. There's, there's a lot of other issues, but Bernard is the only one really that he's got that drive. He knows where he's going and he's going there no matter what. And obviously, there's, there's a lot of investment, personal investment, like I don't know how many millions he might have put out of his own pocket yeah. to, to, to get where he is at. But. I, I love the history lessons as well. And we should touch on it because obviously we're building up to the grand final as well. And first time Catalan are going to play in the grand final. And obviously, they've been to the Challenge Cup final recently. And there's that progression which we talked about with JJB as well. You know, they, they've moved up to this moment. And this feels like a really sort of pivotal moment in their history on, on Saturday. What does it mean to be Catalan? Because Perpignan is the, the last city before the border of, of Spain. Um, so just for, for a bunch of idiots, I'm calling you all idiots, I'm myself, uh, from you know, the Northwest slash South Mark, um, give, us that, give us those Catalan vibes. Um, I mean, personally, I am Catalan born and bred. So obviously my ancestor, my ancestor are all Catalan, like, I spoke, I was taught Catalan as, as a young age. Uh, both of my set of grandparents spoke Catalan at home, never spoke French to each other. Um, similar to rugby league, Catalan was banned in schools uh, in the 40s just because of what happened with Frank, Second World War with Franco and quite a lot of... It was like that, that patriotism, uh, patriotism, is that the word? Yeah, French patriotism, sorry, that was trying to get away from all these little, um, like little little pockets of in independentism mm -hmm. uh, around the country. Yeah, was that driven uh, by Paris? Was that uh, was that a northern? Yeah, that yeah, massively. Money, that's where the power. Yeah, yeah, massively. Is. And like, I'm a massive like I'm a huge, huge French person as well. Very proud Frenchman. However, I've got a massive part of Catalan in me as well. Um, and being Catalan means that obviously you are massively independent mm. and you own something that is completely yours uh, aside from being French. Mm -hmm. And I think that we saw this the other day um, in the semi-final, like the amount of like um, the strength behind all these spectators are behind, like it's, it's not, it's not just the club. It's like, it's the people. Like, and you see that for uh, in Barcelona, obviously FC mm. Barcelona. Um, it's just you get that extra bit of added thing. It's an extra like, identity, isn't it? Hundred percent. Yeah, but it almost, That's I guess, it plays into the narrative of of little old Catalan and what's going to be so good on Saturday is 
you, you feel like everyone's against you and, and history has been against the yeah. Catalan people. You know, I mean, you listen to Pep Guardiola talk and Pep Guardiola, you know, not long ago, every day wore that little uh, independence yellow yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bra uh, brooch on his, on his shirt. And it, it kind of feels that there's... A, it's a like nice a forgotten little, land, I think. It's, it's similar a nice to the symmetry, north, isn't there? It's similar to the north of England, and that, that we're kind of the working class aspects of, of the UK, and we're kind of forgotten a lot of aspects. I, I see parallels with Catalan in terms of both France and, and Spain, in terms of it's kind of forgotten a little bit. It, it's it's not well thought of some, or historically in Madrid and in Paris, and I I feel like you know having sports. I, I know people from from Perpignan, and it feels like. You know they're very proud of where they're from on the back of how they're treated by the governing body. Oh, definitely. We that, we're definitely the poor cousins. Mm. Like in um, versus perfect narrative. Yeah, it, that's exactly what it is. Um, and like, I don't know if you obviously you guys have been. I don't know Will, whether you've been there, but it's a beautiful part of France. Yes, like you, you can't amazing, like you yeah. can't imagine like. Yeah. I've not been there for two years. He's missing it, man. What's it? Exactly. Blame on COVID. Was, yeah, exactly. Blame on COVID. I would blame on COVID. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world. Like you got the beach, you got the sea, you got the um, you, you got the mountains. Yeah? yeah, you swap it for Warrington. Yeah, it's beautiful Warrington. You play the. <laughs> what am I doing? No, you're all doing. You just had a, an internal monologue. That came out. <laughs> What, I just, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> At least I disappeared there for a, two, for a minute, didn't I? But yeah, it's a, for, it's a forgotten part of France because like, you're so far from Paris, like you're a thousand kilometers away from Paris. Um, the side of the Med is like, we are the poor side of the Med. Um, it's very much a working class area. Um, like you haven't got, there's no big fortunes, like there's no, there's no flash, there's no bling, there's not, it's really nature, natural, it's, it's, it's really authentic. Mm. Um, and I think that this is the reason why rugby league is so strong there, because rugby league has got its roots within the ex that, exact, uh, that exact image, and it just fits the people there. Um, and I think that rugby league, even though it is a British game, um, is very much more, like, like you said, north of England, and I think that rugby league in England is felt a little bit that way as well. We'd love to conquer uh, London. We'd love to go bigger all over the UK, but we've got some barriers. Um, and obviously this is the exact same story as it is in, um, in, in Perpignan um, with the added pressure, not the added pressure, but the added thing of being Catalan as well. Um, like, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's nowhere near what it is being Catalan in, um, in Catalonia, in, in Spain. Um, we're not, there's a very small number of people that are calling for independence. Like, it, I don't think it's, it's not political where we are. Um, we are French first and foremost, and now we are uh, pra catalonian But um, yeah, there is so much, there are so much synergy between um, what it is to be where I'm from, Perpignan and the Catalonia region, and what it is to be a rugby league play or a rugby league fan yeah. from the north north of England. Well, this, what this, your, your view on this though? Yeah. Just, just um, well, answer this one first. The, because I know you've talked about this and we, expansion is something we've talked mm. about so much on this podcast, isn't it? And it's had its criticism, of course, and Catalan when they first came in. I mean, you played in the first Super League game for Catalan, didn't you? Was it 2006? Which we'll talk about in a minute. But given that they've had their critics and, you know, Toronto have had it and the New York City vibe had it. Robert Elston, when we spoke to him, was so keen to have that Toulouse Catalan derby, to have a French derby, uh, which, which could still well happen down down the line. But is Catalan's story now not completely justified by what they're yeah. doing on Saturday and with what they've done with the Challenge Cup? Look, I, I actually think the when we're talking of expansion, <laughs> we we almost didn't need to expand, you know, in a flamboyant way. We, we had a seam of 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 opportunity in in the south of France. Um, you know, Carcassonne, Limoux, um, you know, Catalan, Toulouse, these areas which have historically been niches rugby league that have got a strong history attached with the game were always the most sensible source to expand the game. And it takes, look, I think what Jerome said is, is genius. It, it takes somebody with vision and passion and drive to push it. Because if we think we're all sat here now and somebody is going to spontaneously step up in Whitehall in London and go, do you know what? 
I think we should give this rugby league a chance up north. Or nobody's going to do it. You've got to batter people's doors doors down. Well, we've got Sir Lindsay Hoyle on side now, haven't we? Yeah. After a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> fine. Um, you, know, you need <laughs> to. I say fine like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, look, well you need you need somebody with vision to lead, and Bernard Guash has done that at Catalan, and and look what he's done. Just somebody having that commitment and leadership and drive to do something. And the game has been accommodating to them, and, and rightly so. But I think that, you know, France, the story, the, the synergy with the north of England, the the disparity between the north and south, which is flipped in France, where the financial power lies in the north. And all of these stories, it, it, it's the, the essence of rugby league, isn't it? We've never dealt with the fact that we are poor second-class citizens to London. You know, London disregards rugby league completely, doesn't it? And and we've got this edgy, chippy, northern mentality, and that's like our thing, isn't it? And it's the same in France, you know, and same in where Jerome's from. It's that, it's that. Do you feel cut off being that far away? We spoke to Steve McNamara, didn't we, on the podcast, remember? And he was sort of saying he liked that. He liked being it's, out it, of it can the, be a the Northwest philosophy. bubble. Especially this time of year when I suppose Catalan have probably got a bit of pressure on them, having finished as league leaders, to kind of stay away from the limelight, concentrate on what they've been doing all year. But I was so excited to see the crowd at the weekend. I mentioned it before. It was packed, wasn't it? It was packed. It was the best atmosphere I've seen at a rugby league match for a long time. Sell out. It was, it was just brilliant to see. And, you know, having watched in 2006 when they came into the competition and see the players, which are mostly... Uh, French, a lot of the dominant players are French, or the packs French. To see homegrown players, the other players who have, have drip drip fed into, the, fed into the team during the season, have got lots of potential. The, obviously, the, the conveyor belt of talent is, is coming through at Catalan. Such a great atmosphere, and they're, they're a massive chance this week. But to see the the club to to grow into an emerging powerhouse, you know, we said before, four teams have, have won won Super League. Historically, that they could be the fifth, but be the fifth and 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 be up there for a long time. And you know, Jerome can can eulogise more than me on, on how well they've done. But I, I I think it was brilliant. How how big is this in France? Because and I know it's been growing. And obviously, you know, wh wh where would it sit in the papers? Is this going to be front? Is it going to be back page? Have you got to turn fifteen pages to, to work out if uh, this is big. Saints on Saturday? Yeah, yeah, this is big. This is big. Like, um, I mean, you spoke French before, but l'équipe, journal l'équipe. Yeah. Um, Semi-final was on, like they had a three-page spread um, on their uh, Saturday edition, which is like, that's huge news. Mm. Uh, they were live on TV, um, on Canal Plus, uh, on B in sport. So that's that's another massive win. Like this is, this would be the equivalent of, um, like, this is bigger than Sky Sports for us mm. um, over there. So, And has that grown from, we, Mark, you touched on it before when you were JJ, but was it 2017, Catalan nearly went down? Yeah, 2017. 2017. Yeah. So from that season, has it has then it progressively got bigger and bigger and bigger from that yeah. from that point. Yeah, it, it is because the thing is with rugby league and where we come from, where we are, we're not in the spotlight. So when you're not in spotlight, what's required is extra effort. So you always need to prove that you are good, as opposed to doing something and everyone think that you are. And that's exactly what we're trying. Like that's that's exactly what the club has had to do for 16 years since we've been there. It's it's been hard, mate. It's it's been massively hard like trying I was listening to you guys talking about culture, talking about and it was fascinating. Um it was really fascinating because like I was at the club in 2006 when we were informed and and the biggest thing with the power that was in and and the new coaching staff at the time it was Steve Deacon um David Wave was appointed as as football director. Um, Steve left, uh, Potty came in, and the bigger thing was all about culture. And culture is a massive, massive word, and and potentially, or, or no, not potentially, I know it's the harder thing to to build uh, because it needs to last. The hardest thing to do at the Catalan was that you had to do this with half the team not speaking the same language. And then that becomes harder because obviously a lot of what you do or a lot of what you're trying to lead with 
is done by example. So you have to do it. However, there is there is a speech. There has to be a speech. There has to be a discussion. It's explain why. Don't exactly, you? mate. Yeah. Ex exactly. And that was that was massively hard to start to start with. So we had a, like the first year, two thousand and six, was like as you all know, like we won the first game, and and uh, I remember like if it was yesterday, like everyone there thought that we were world champion. Like how good is Super League? How easy is it? Like we just turn over Wigan. Like this is unbelievable. Like we party for three days. Like <laughs> <laughs> they would never won a game for about eight rounds. <laughs> we got battered by about forty every day, uh, every weekend. But a lot of people forget also um, that. The first six years that we were there, like traveling to England was waking up at four o'clock in the morning, taking a bus down to London, uh, uh, to sorry, down to uh, Barcelona, that's two and a half hour drive, waiting in the lounge, taking a plane. The trip was 12 hours. You were leaving on the Thursday because there was no flood on a Friday. To get to witness. <laughs> exactly. Wow. In the line Can line you imagine of, leaving of on a Thursday to get to witness on a exactly. Saturday? Yeah. When you got there, you were like, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, like a bend, it's like a bender gone wrong, isn't it? <laughs> Mate, so we get in there. So it was a, like a, it was a four-day trip. So people kind of forget sometimes um, like how hard that was. And to put into perspective to what you were saying about what they've done this year and how good, how good they've come. Like they've played like pretty much 70% of the game away this year. They've won. They've only lost, was it three games or four games mm -hmm. in the season? Whatever it is. Yeah. With the travel that they've done and the amount of adversity that they've they had to overcome there, like this is huge. Mm -hmm. Like this is massive. And the story that's been told in France is exactly this. Um, and this is why it's been picked up, obviously, by the medias as well. Um, the club has grown massively in stature. Uh off the back of that, but yeah, it's been a massive long road, like huge, huge long road. Mm. And do, do you think, you know, <laughs> I know it's, it might be, this might be a really tenuous link, but Brexit, right? You know, there's this, this separation in the EU and, and the UK. Is there an element in the French press of loving the fact there's a French team coming over and dishing it to the English teams? <laughs> massively. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Fair play. Yeah, massively. Love it, love it, like, do, you know what? do you know what? It's like being politi politically correct, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. like, I remember, this is, a, like, this is a standing joke in France. Like, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're losing a game in England, like, you go around and shake the hand and it's good game, good game, thinking like, we got you there, but we really, we, we got it, didn't we? <laughs> Fucking roast beef. Wanker. Exactly, mate. That's exactly what it is. So, so to get that one back with the Brexit, with whatever's happening in the world and, yeah, and, yeah. and the COVID as well. Like, I think that the COVID, like, was, I think, I honestly think that if you would have spoke to a lot of people last year at the start of the season, despite the fact that the Dragons, like, Recruitment wise, like we've been known like over the last 15 years for attracting some big talents, aren't we? The Stacey Jones, um, Steve Menzies, like we've always had like massive talents. But two years ago, if you would have said you're going to play all your games away, you're going to travel every week, no one would have given us a chance. Like I don't think, even, even though we had a good, like a good squad, I think that this year, the level of consistency that they've got. And I think that it comes down to exactly what you talked about, about culture. And I spoke to Steve Mack the other day and there's a lot of um, proven leaders in the team that actually lead by example. Um, and I was listening to your discussion earlier and like, I'm not even any close to you guys, like in terms of experience of big games. Uh, and it was fascinating to listen to like the, the, like the pressure points and the anticipation of that big game and and what to go through and so forth and and I think that this year obviously they with the experience that they got the like the, the likes of James Maloney the likes of Sam Tompkins Mickey Mack Ben Garcia to a degree for a French guy they've got the nucleus of players that have all touched silverware but they have led by example by doing what they do best on the field and they've done that consistently um, and I think that like they're in a pretty pretty place at the moment. Then they're sat in a good position. I don't think I don't think I think they'll have pressure, but I don't think it's the same pressure 
that Saints will have is a completely yeah. different. I think, I think when you've had players like Maloney or Tompkins or Garcia to a certain extent, like you said, who have been there and done it, it kind of eases things for the other players because they'll the, a lot of the young guys or a lot of the other players will look up to those those kind of figureheads within the team, those leaders who've been there and done it. And if they kind of say, lads, just chill this week, we've got this, it'll kind of ease a bit of pressure on them. They won't feel the same because their idols, those cultural architects will kind of know how to handle the situation. I think other people will follow. And I think when a team's in a final, you've got those kind of charismatic individuals that have been there, done it so many times, won trophies. They kind of set a precedent for everybody else, and I think that's a massive plus oh, you, for, for, for Carlo. Yeah, you look in big situations, you look to people for confidence, don't you? So the worst thing in a situation like that is, you know, you're in a big game, Catalan are playing in a big final, and you look around, you know, let's say James Maloney kicks the ball out on the full in the first two minutes. For me, that is curtains for Catalan. Do you know what I mean? That, that sort of thing, you are looking around for detail of people who've been on the path before and who were doing it right. And Catalan this year, I think, two things I think that's worked really well for them. One is they've been together a lot in this country. And for people who don't know, when you're in a team, like you might live in an area near each other, but you, you don't live with each other fully. You know, you don't have lunch together every day. You don't have dinner together every day. Whereas I think Catalan being over here a lot, I think it's really galvanized and allowed them to build some culture. You know, whereas other teams, you know, don't have that luxury in as much as they don't have as much interaction together. You know, you know, Jamie Jones Buchanan he speaks about the Leeds team of the past and they're all really close friends and they, they had that interaction. Well, a lot of teams are just sort of mushed together. You don't get it. Whereas Catalan have got that. And I think it's really powerful just being around people long enough to one, respect them professionally, learn to like them, learn to love them, become friends. And then once you've got that, like, fuck me, anything's possible. You know, and I think Catalan have got that off the, and also what they've got is a series of really competent senior players, which I don't think they got right in the past. They signed players like Dave Taylor, you know, as an example, who, who's just a Willie wrong- Mason, you didn't like him either. Willie Mason. You know, tell the McLaurin story again? No, I don't. <laughs> well, Willie Mason. No, but why? Well, what relevance has that got to where I'm going with this? Can you tell me where? Look, can you? Are you it's listening? A good story, Mark. Where am What's I going? Story? Will, where am you I know going with this? The story. No, I don't know that. I'm going. You're not going to tell it. Well, I can tell it. He punched. What? He punched me in a scrum. <laughs> <laughs> he did what a lot they of people want wanted to do. That's what he did. No, he punched me. In, no, what no, did he no, say no. to you? No, well, he, 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 he just looked at me deadpan and said, "Do you understand?" <laughs> <laughs> And, and I did. I understood. <laughs> I understood. But yeah, Catalan, what they've got, a couple of things right. I think they've got recruitment right. And, you know, look, what are we without recruitment in rugby league? Because we're a capped sport. You can't just sign somebody on big money and it not work. It has to work. So for anybody who's getting it right at the minute in Super League, you know, they've, they've recruited well. And Sam Tompkins has been fucked. Massive, hasn't he? We had him yeah. as, as, a, as a player, obviously one man of steel, but as a as, as a winner, as a personality, as a leader, leader, leader that's the I, one, isn't I, it? I played it with Sam at the academy in at Wigan 12, 13 years ago. And you could see he was competitive, see he was a winner, but his personality would r r rub off on other people. And this last two years, I've, I've seen him play, and you can see the impact he has on other people. And I think you'll probably all agree, he's been as well as on the field, but personality-wise, you can tell that, that he's kind of, he's been a galvanised the team massively and just driven the standards both yeah, on and he, off the field. Yeah, because he's bought into being there as well. Yeah, yeah, like, he he lives, just, I'm he just lives, about to say that. He lives yeah. in a village. He lives in yeah. a village. He likes like, it, doesn't he? He, he knows, knows the knows local it, yeah. greengrocers. He goes down there, mm. he buys some white asparagus, you know, a bottle <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, he buys he some it. beautiful cheese. You know, a nice bottle of uh, Lang de Lot Rousselon, you know, Ooh. red, you know, Van Rouge. He Garlic, loves it. He snails. loves it. Mm. Whereas I imagine Dave it's Taylor, I imagine Dave Taylor that. signing there, wearing board shorts, <laughs> flip flops, <laughs> and, and driving around trying to find a fucking chicken schnitzel. Like, bro, <laughs> fuck off, Dave. Why don't you go back to, why don't you go back to <laughs> you Australia? Want, <laughs> you wouldn't say that if, if he was here, would you? Well, no, I wouldn't say that if he was don't here, because Mark, I'm then. not an emotional.
I'd be like, hi, Dave. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Sorry well, it didn't Dave, work out in Dave, France. Dave, you Sorry it didn't work out in, no, in but Australia. This is, this is the thing. So they've got people who have actually... But that's down to Steve, isn't it? You've worked with Steve. You worked yeah. with Steve at the end. Did, tell me if I'm wrong. Didn't you? Yeah, a couple yeah. of years? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah correct. Did um did a um three months with, with Steve. I think, yeah, it's down to, to a few factors. I think that you got a spot on there. I think even like four... Was it four years, three years ago that Sam signed? Mm. I don't think that many, many people have thought, majority of people have thought, like, this guy's going for his paycheck. Yeah, yeah. Like, was it his ankle that was gone or his, his knee? Broken, Whatever yeah. it was. Uh, didn't look great at mm. Wigan his last season. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought he was on the out, like, massively. Like, so it was a big punt. Uh, what happened was that I think there was, like, a complete fusion between one Steve Mack Obviously, um, selling him the message of what he wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, obviously, some listening. But also, there's that point that, like you said, Johnny, like he loves where he is. He's, he's just happy. I, I texted him the other day uh, on, on, on Instagram. Um, last, it was last night. I texted him saying, uh, congrats on what you've done. Like, first thing that he said, like, I love this place. I just love the club. That's the first thing that he said is, I think it's, it takes two to tango. Like you, you, whether you're a good player or not, if you're not happy where you are, yeah, it's never going to work. Yeah, yeah. Like everyone knows that Sam is a great player. Um, but three years ago, I would have thought he was probably at his, I wouldn't say his lowest, but quite well, close people to People were saying he's going for yeah, one final paycheck. Exactly. You know, whatever, right, yeah. I mean, to be man of steel and then be in a grand final, yeah, it's, it's proved everyone wrong, isn't it? Yeah, it's unreal. Unreal. And obviously he's been the driving force of, of the team. Uh, like I'm not there with him, but everything that I'm hearing is that, he oozes confidence, but also um, he brings like the everyone level-headed. Like he, any pressure that there is, he diffuses it for the not only for himself but for the whole team. And that's exactly what you said. Like, and again, like him not playing to, on Saturday or him playing could be could be something big. Yeah. After Morg is brilliant player. Yeah. But in a big game, like you need some Tongans, even though he's not going to be. He might not be one hundred percent. Everyone knows that, but. I'm just remembering as well. Remember, we had him on a few weeks ago, and he sort of when he said goodbye to Martin, who sold him his white asparagus, and he drove over in his Land Rover Defender, and he, he made like the, what was it, a f two thousand mile trip or something all the way up and round, and he drove up to back to back to Wigan, back home, back to Mummy. Um, he yeah, he loves it. He does love it. He loves it. Um, look, I want, to, I want to ask you the obvious question, but I'm really interested in, in your answer with it. What would it mean? if they win it, because we talked about Salford getting to a grand final and that may never happen again, Mark. It may not, but Salford may never get there again, just given when you look at the list since 98 of the teams who've been in those final two. Since I left, the, since the you left they have haven't got any chance of getting there. So it feels different for Catalan because there's a momentum, doesn't it? There's something building there. They're building on that Challenge Cup success and they're, and they're, they're still going in that, their graph is going up. If they're, to, if they're to, to win it and stop Saints from making it three out of three, what would that do to that club? It'd be massive, to be huge. Um, I think that the um, the Challenge Cup success in eighteen like changed the club, like changed um, the perception of what a lot of people had of the club, um, which is what you talked about before, <laughs> nearly winning or nearly scoring a try. Like it, it's. Like you so close yet so far from winning mm. all the time. Um and eighteen what it made was that there is now a tr like there's a trophy cabinet. Like you can put a trophy in there. But Super League as opposed to the Challenge Club is uh, the Challenge Cup, sorry, is it's it's all about consistency. It's like twenty four rounds plus playoffs. Like you like you, you prove your complete strength. I'm not saying that obviously winning the Challenge Cup is easy, but luck of the draw. It's easier, have, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you, you have a good draw in the semi, make the final in one game. Um, it's very hard in Super League like to do that. Um, but for them to win this would be like would be incredible, like incredible. And I don't think that it'd be incredible just for for um, for the Catalan, obviously. But I think it'd be incredible for Super League as a whole and Rugby League as a whole. I think that potentially um, the Catalan Dragons are, and I don't know, like I'm probably saying that because I'm very like Catalan driven, but I would say they're potentially the biggest Super League club in the Southern Hemisphere as well. 
probably the one that get the most press just because of the players that have played in the game and, and so forth. Um, so for them to win that, I think that it would galvanise what Super League is as a whole and Rugby League is. Uh, and obviously the Catalan are also like, they're also playing for France. So that would improve like a lot of things. Um, yeah, it'd be massive, it'd mm. be huge. Uh, uh, for you, it must be emotional because we didn't really dig into that, that first time that they came into Super League 2006. But before that, you'd won the grand final, the equivalent in France, hadn't you? Yeah. With, with Catalan. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who played back then had sort of said it was very amateurly run and it was kind of, you know, I mean, even now, uh, we talked about Bernard and he has to fund everything and the travel and all this stuff. And he's, that's on his back. That's from his paycheck. But how drastically different in the space of those, yeah. what is it, 15 years? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's massively different. Like, it's the equivalent of... Um, it's the equivalent of the um, the amateur league here. Like it's you're talking about like it's it's black and white, like literally. Um and you don't know until you, you play in it, you know what I mean? How like, many people were there for that grand final in France? Uh I can't remember, ten, fifteen thousand, I'd say. Oh, it's still like, a decent crowd. Still still yeah. decent crowd, yeah. Still a decent crowd, but it's it's just a level of football that's been played, like the level of rugby uh, rugby league that's been played. It's 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 really amateur, you know what I mean? Like it's talking about like a, a fight every ten minutes and you know what I mean, like it's aggressive French yeah, rugby. Oh isn't yeah, it? yeah. Two minutes in and, that. and 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 uh, and I hope this doesn't get changed because that's 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 the essence of rugby league as well. Like you know, you need that. Uh, you don't need that in rug in Super League. I think that we talked about it, like broadcasting rights, and you can't have that every every time. But I think that you need the level of. Um, ill discipline and yeah, yeah, violence to a degree. Yes, yeah. violence. You've you, you got to be violent when you're a rugby league player. You have to be Absolutely. like to a degree. Like obviously, sometimes you overstep the mark or or you don't. You decide not to or whatever. But I think it's a violent sport. So so you need that. And I think that yeah, it's um, it'd be massive mate. if if we want it. It yeah, it'd be a hell of a tale, wouldn't it? I mean, obviously yeah. you want yeah. sense to make the hat trick, but I mean yeah, no, they've got a bloody good chance in they Catalan. Yeah, I I. I do I want Saints to make the hat-trick? Yes, of course I do. But this is a situation, I think, where the game can't lose or I can't lose as a fan of the game because yeah. if Saints win, it's an incredible feat for them because it's, um, you know, just excellence personified in over a few years. But if Catalan win, it's like, it just is a punch in the face for the game to go, look, right? We talk about expansion. There's this area that's very close to us where we have got the opportunity to make something amazing. To lose the top of the championship, Catalan tops the Super League. Like the expansion sort of conversation shouldn't even be happening, should it? It's mental. And I just think it'd be an amazing chance for the game to refocus and, and really just understand what the next steps are and uh it's been very organic growth by both clubs though hasn't it yeah and i think there's look and, that, and that's is, something i think rather right. than there's been patience though hasn't that's, there? What, that's what i mean organic there's patience growth because, and patience. because catalan lived with the fact that they couldn't be relegated for a number of seasons mm -hmm. now if we want to take expansion seriously and we want to expand into areas mm -hmm. then why would we not afford that luxury to other clubs who yeah. came in and i'm not saying this purely as a disgruntled toronto ex-player who <laughs> hasn't been paid by david argyle who for, still owes me for, for a long time still owes, you? um fairs and is it <laughs> <laughs> I no, but, but what I'm saying is, if you want to, if you want nearly if, millions, if if you want an area to expand, then give them time and yeah. take it slow. Take a slow, slow but attitude that, to that, growth. That, that's on the uh, responsibility of the, the governing body, but also the club. I think um, Bern, Bernard Guash, who, who um, it's just got pockets of a shake. Yeah, yeah. It's just like that. Yeah, but he's been, <laughs> he's been, he's not had his name plastered all over the papers. Yeah. He's not done it for no, five I'm years joking. or six years. He's done it for 15 years. And What's just, in it for him? And, for Bernard. Because well, he cares. Yeah. And he's, and well, he used to it's, play Bernard, didn't used, he? Yeah. Mm. But I mean, is it, is it purely, you know, who knows with, with owners where their motives come from? Yeah. <laughs> Ego he's, sometimes. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't think this is the case. He's not the Marlon no, Kukash in the South West. Yeah, I don't think that it, was all ego. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's the case. I think that he's... Um, I don't think he'll ever retire. Mm. I just think that he's got that vision. He's got, um, he's got that drive. It, that's exactly what he is as a businessman. Like, 
the, the way that he's grown his business, which started like with his dad 60 years ago, is exactly the same as what the Dragons were in 2006. Nobody knew us. Uh, I mean, no one, no one gave us a chance. If you, if Bernard could speak English, his story is unbelievable. Mm. Like unbelievable. Um, Does he not speak any English? Uh, he speaks a little bit. We'll get yeah. him on the pod and I'll do it. We'll get him in. Yeah, <laughs> you, need, you guys need to get him in. It's it's mm. mind blowing. I'd love to speak. Yeah. Like his his dad won the championship with USAP, which is the rugby union side, in yeah. 1951. The story goes that so he won the the main championship, which is the Bouclier de Brenus. Um, and he was a butcher at the time. Um, and he wanted to buy a stall in the um in the main square in Perpignan. Um USAP couldn't fund it. So he went to Tres Catalan and they could fund it. So he said, Listen, I need to go. I gotta go. And that that was it. So he switched from union to league. At that time in the fifties, mate, that was like yeah. Imp- you well, can't do that. Treacherous. Like really you're sad. talking like, yeah, yeah. Judas, yeah, like yeah, go yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cut the head off in a square. Yeah, that's it. Like literally. Um and that's how it started. And then he went from a market stall from his dad um, to him starting the business probably about 30, 35 years ago, mm. like a small little enterprise to now being like potentially the biggest meat wholesale in uh, uh, potentially France yeah, yeah, or Southern France, like you're talking millions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, does he care about his money? Obviously he does. Uh, but ten pounds to you is probably like ten thousand to him. Yeah. So obviously, like it, it doesn't really matter. What it is 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 the end goal for him, which is like when he gets into something, he needs to do it to his best. But this mm. this is I think what's different about Bernard is if you have resources and you want to invest in something, you will get bored eventually. Unless, well, you're pa- but, unless you're passionate about it, Will. So you can, when, what about when you complete it? So what if they win? Because that is the no, end no, game, no, isn't it? To no, win no, no, no. Simply. no, no I, I, I don't think... I, what I'm trying to say is you can have limitless funds and get involved in something, Yeah. but that gets tested immediately and gets tested repeatedly by the game, kicking back at you. Whereas Bernard, to continue to invest and keep investing, there was no guarantee that it'd come good. And there's no guarantee in three or four years that it will be good. Exactly. But you need passion to keep doing that. Yeah. It's like watching a huge direct debit go out of your bank account for something you really don't care about. And you just, if you don't really care about it, you'll get rid of it, won't you? Do you know what really interests me about that as well with owners, and I'll just bring it to football for two seconds, is, you know, you talk about, for example, look at Manchester City's owners, right? Sheikh Mansour, the Abu Dhabi Football Group and so on, and the people that advise these guys who are signing the checks, Right. They're not football people. I know that's become a cliche. They're not football people. So they, they don't know what they're doing. They need those. They need that kind of character in their ear to say, this is what we're going to do. Da, da, da. Who, who is that guy with, with Bernard? Is it purely down to Steve? For example, you know, at City, there's a, there's a chairman, but that's the friend of the owner. So there's, there seems, then you can have a big divide between the fans and what the direction of the club is going. Who's the, who's the sidekick that makes it all tick at Catalan? This is a great question because... Um, there's been a massive momentum switch there. Um, the earliest year, Bernard was so energetic and so passionate and so um, so involved that he ended up being yeah. the manager, yeah. and and that was common fact. Like, is that dangerous? I, so hands oh, on. Oh, it's, it can be very dangerous. Yeah, actually. it can be dangerous if he doesn't yeah. succeed. Mm. Like if you succeed, no problem. You pick your own team, you sign your own play, you've got success. That's absolutely fine. But if you've got that mentality or that drive, which is not always negative, it's, it, it, it's not negative. It's, it's just like there was no one to challenge it and so forth. So it didn't work for a long, for a long period. Like you talk about the names that you mentioned, like Dave Taylor, Willie Mason, all these names. Um, Bernard wanted them. Like these are big names in rugby league terms. So when you say that to Bernard, like you think big eyes, you think this is unbelievable. Um, the big momentum switch has been since Steve arrived at the club. Um, and I think it's, it's very similar to a good French wine. 
You get better with age. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Oh, and put a, put, a cheese as well. put a cheese on the side. Uh, white asparagus. Uh, exactly. <laughs> the Land Rover all the way. Um, I think that he, um, I know that Bernard understood that he couldn't go on like this forever. Yeah, yeah. And Steve came in and slotted him perfectly because one as an Eng England, English coach, sorry, he knows the competition inside out. He knew Australia inside out as well from his patches there. So his knowledge of the overall industry is unbelievable. However, full credit to Steve, he's the only one who stood up to him, stood up to him and managed to twist his wing and to, to get him to reason. Yeah, I, I think situations like that where an owner is directly involved in recruitment in sport rarely, never works well. It never no, works well because it undermines a coach who you've got, who is, you've brought him in as an expert. It's like having a business and bringing somebody in to specifically do a job and then constantly undermining them by you going over the head is, in that situation, it removes the power from the coach. So in the dressing room as a player, you're like, well, this guy's got no, <laughs> it just changes the structure of a team. And Steve then taking charge of recruitment is the right thing because Bernard, unbelievable businessman, but the game changes so quickly. And I reckon you're only 18 months off completely not understanding what's going on. And you need your finger on the pulse to make great recruitment decisions. Willie Mason, as an example, you know, would have been a, a you know a world class player at a time. But if you've not seen him play for two years or twelve months or seen bits of him, you know, how would you know about his competency? So, coaches and people who are the most competent people technically need to make recruitment decisions. And I think Jerome's right that the biggest thing for Catalan is, and it was visible from the outside that the recruitment decisions came down to the coach who knew the most. And it wasn't about the owner getting big names to get headlines, to make a big statement, because ultimately it rarely works well. That. Mm. Do you know what? It's such a good story, and I'm so glad you, you've told it so well, Joe. Yeah, amazing. Brilliant, brilliant guest. Because, um, and, and, and this is my frustration sometimes with rugby league, is that they have these brilliant, brilliant stories. You only have to scratch beneath the surface to have these incredible tales and narrative building up to to Saturday. And it is intriguing, isn't it? It is intriguingly poised. You're, go, you're working there? We're going yep, as little guests, aren't we? We're guests of honour. Guests of super. Know, he's put, Free bar, apparently. I don't think we're guests, eh? <laughs> we're not. We're in Rosette, mate, no, in the Stretford end. Yeah. Um, you're going to be there, Jerome, I take it. I'll of definitely course. be there. Good man. Yeah, yeah. Um, Come to the free bar if you want. 100%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> and he's on two clicks tab on Saturday. I'm on the van But I really, really appreciate you coming down, Jerome. Thank you so much. And look, for, for you guys watching, for the 820, I think the few left now, there's 820 <laughs> left. Um, thank you so much for coming down. It's been great to do it in front of you guys. And we're going to just open up any little questions you want to, um, to Jerome. Yes, go for it. Great question. Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Um, Repeat the question as well, Jerome, if you can. Uh, just yeah. that mic. <laughs> I think um, as a Frenchman, I think that having two Super League teams is massive. Uh, however, I think that Catalan winning Super League is, is huge for the game. I think being the first team to actually lift the tro trophy and take it abroad, I think is, is, is massive. So I'd have, I'd have to say uh, Catalan. However, I think like... Sometimes I, I kind of pinch myself, I think, to um, to think that Toulouse won the championship or League Leader Shield, then Catalan won the League Leader Shield in Super League. Like, this is ridiculous. Thinking that we're going to win the how, World how, Cup How next strong year. can Toulouse be? Because I've not seen as much um, what a city. Ex exposure Has anybody been of to lose. <laughs> what a derby that would be. What a game. Honestly. Yeah. You talk it, about places to go and travel, right? That you is get, nice. Yeah. You, get, you get to go and watch rugby Is it as good as Wakefield and Castleford? It is. <laughs> Just, Seriously, as yeah. a Wakefield fixture, yeah. is well, it up there? The holy trinity of Castleford, Pontefract, Wakefield, that. <laughs> Featherston. What about Featherston? Featherston's, Featherston's a, a, a quadruple. 
Yeah, but you talk about playing rugby league. Like, I, you know, I was privileged to go out to Toronto and play rugby league, and you think, wow, like, this is just an amazing... You get play. fucking paid. Perpignan, <laughs> what a place. Like, everybody who's travelled there, an unbelievable place. It kind of plage, collier. Lovely. Unbelievable. Mm. I've been for two Have years. Have you sued David? I've been for two years. Have you sued David Algar, by the way? I'm well. not suing David, David Algar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 To lose, what, just an unbelievable... That'd be unreal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they get good crowds, good infrastructure? And, and Toulouse, uh, Toulouse, is, Toulouse are very, very professional. They're, um, they're signed a... Um, I don't know the, the exact term or the deal, but it's like a dual agreement with Stade Toulouse, which is Stade Toulouse is probably the, I'd say the biggest rugby club in, yeah. in Europe. Like massive huge organisation. Massive, like massive you're top 14, like, yeah. Huge, yeah, like 25,000 every game. Like it's huge. Yeah. Um, organisation wise, like they're, they're, they're well equipped, yeah. really well equipped. Um, is the TV deal on the cards just off the back of that? Is that, you know, because rugby league is obsessed with expanding its footprint and can an entity bring something think, to yeah, the table. I think having two teams in France competing at the highest level, it's straight away much more credential to go to Canal Plus, to go to Bean Sport, to sign like a big TV deal. Mm. Obviously Sky Sports, hoping are still going to be there. They're, they're there next year, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. But not paying much, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. There's it's, no bidding war, is there? That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Anyway, so that's having yeah, that's, that's let's get Emmanuel one, but... Macron. Right, let's get it on Canal <laughs> that's it, Plus. Mate. Super yeah. League. You're gonna have get to buy, it, yeah. you're gonna have should to we, download Canal Plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Emmanuel Macron. I know you're a big fan of the show. If you want to, you want to put some more money into the game, that'd be great. Look, we've kept you guys so late as well. Any final questions? I see your pint glasses are empty, and we oh, it's one o'clock in the morning now, so we do need to let everyone go. And yeah. the guys down here, I like seven how brothers, Will can see every out oh, of the 820 people, every single pint glass. Pint. Any final questions? Anyone? Hands up. Go on, go for it. What's the formula for ex successful expansion? Is that for me? Mm. Open um, to all, yeah. For me, I think that you need to go to proven places where rugby league has got a history to start with. You need to rely on strong foundations um, to start with. I don't think that Toronto was the wrong option. However, I think that if something goes wrong, you straight away, you're back against the wall. Um, so I'd say go the safer route, safest route to start with, to have a strong foundation. When you got this, once you got this, then you can expand. Uh, I don't think that as an infrastructure and as an organization, we're big enough to afford to go to places where we haven't got strongholds. Yeah. Well, I think like the, the one of the biggest things and. Jerome touched on it, it's passion. So, right, the likelihood of you finding a, a billionaire who's passionate enough about rugby league in a place where rugby league doesn't exist is, is quite rare, isn't it? You know, to find somebody. And what we've done by accident is make the game completely uninvestable to these people. Because if I was a billionaire um, and I wanted to invest in sport, I'd want to make a difference really quickly. We're in a salary capped sport, you know, entry to... Uh, the top competition probably requires two or three years of effort getting through the championship and through whatever to get to there. So you're asking somebody like David Argyle, you know, from Toronto, who put £10 million of his own money in, to then be, we talk about him like he's a comedian, you know, like he's a joke. He spent 10 million quid in you rugby league. You didn't see how much, much of that. How much? I, I, no, but I did. I did. I did. I signed a deal with it. I knew exactly what I was getting into when I signed for Toronto. I knew exactly what I was getting into. But you, you've got to respect the investment the people who own clubs make to keep our game going. And Bernard is a prime example of somebody, but the difference is he had a, a passion to just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And, and that, I think that might be the most important ingredient but we've got to respect and make the game investable. So I don't think we do a great job at allowing expansion to happen because David Argyle spends 10 million quid and then we chase him out of town like he's a fucking cartoon villain. And and don't get me wrong, like he, he got things wrong. He did, you know, the club was, you know, five, six years old. It was, it was like nowhere near perfect. Of course it wasn't. But you've got to respect the amount of money he spent. Marwan Kukash, we take the piss out of him all the time. He spent more money in the game than I ever have. I've just took money out of the game. 
I've took like you know a lot of money but, out of the game. But I think no, he, he would have got more out of his investment had he done it smartly, though. And I think if the game had helped him, does as that well. not come down to that? Yeah, but nobody. Them? Why would that why would a league person people don't, the owners? But people don't help those people, do they? There's not. It's not a help. It's a hangout to dry sort of scenario, isn't it? I think you're right there. I think I think as as a game, I think that we're at a stage where we need more people to help us than we can actually help people. I think in terms of expansion, that is obviously, but like the likes of Marwan, the likes of David, like you said, I think that finding these guys is hard. How hard is it? Like, and getting them to actually put the hands in the po in the pocket is. is and when they get burnt, like David has done, why would they be queuing up to come again? Well, exactly. You know, why, why would someone in New York go? This is going to work this time. You know, it's dead. That isn't it? It's exactly. Dead. That project's gone for good. I, I, I agree with you there, Johnny. I think that. I think it's bad as an organisation. I think as a as proud rugby leaguers to throw stones to people that have invested their own money yeah. because mate, we're all humans. Like it's hard to get something off the ground. How hard is it? Like yeah, yeah, we're yeah. talking about Bernard. Like that, it could have gone tits up like four yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. If if Sam Tonkins wasn't playing well or whatever, then no one would have been speaking about the Carolina yeah. Dragons. We were relegated. That's it. Gone. It's over. Yeah. Like, it's over. Like, obviously, there is a degree of, I wouldn't say chance, but opportunism. Uh, and you got you got to take it. But these guys that are coming in, like, everyone knows. And like you said, it's hard to get people to try to invest. Like, who wants to invest in Bellevue? Like, who wants to go, like, do we think that the game can be promoted in Dubai, for instance? Like, at the moment, no. But unless we get these people and we... we we, we treat them right to a degree and there are going to be some that are coming in and out but I think that we need to give them a little bit more of a chance and I, and I, it's, it's tough mate. and I think as well because we were so craving that investment do we do the right due diligence on the people who we allow to invest in in the sport because I think the, the unintended consequence of letting somebody like Marwan Kukash David Argyle invest in the sport and it backfire is just a huge fuck up where there's somebody there who was the right fit, a Bernard, somebody who's the right fit who will not now do that. And and we we can't kid ourselves that in a con, you know a, a shrinking TV market, it re reduction in commercial revenues, you know crowds, you know uh, there's mixed sort of results on where they're at. We need private investment. And like I can't emphasise enough for expansion. The key to expansion is somebody with money who believes in what this game can do. And like this game is an unbelievable sport. It's incredible. In just in what it brings, the pace of it, the intensity, um, all of the things that it brings. But we can't do this pantomime chasing off people who've spent the money in the game because it's so damaging, it's so damaging to, to the future of expansion. It was a long answer to the question. It was a great question. Um, so I either apologise that we've almost done two podcasts for you for the price of one or <laughs> say you're welcome. I'm not quite sure. Money. Yeah. Um, but look, and, and quote of the day for me, quote of the podcast, I think was fuck off Dave Taylor and your fucking board shorts. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I did say uh, he's probably in his board shorts trying to find a chicken schnitzel. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Which is better than my quote. Um, look, let's hear it for Jerome Gise, everybody. So there we go. Look, guys, we kept you long enough. Uh, really, really appreciate you guys coming down because uh, basically we're just three wankers sat on a couch just chatting and four. it could go on. Four. Four, well, four now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> you're wanking out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want a wanker now. If you, if you are going down to the grand final, we are going to be, John's too big time. He's doing stuff for Sky, getting paid more money. Mark and I, Mark's always there, isn't it? It's always me and I'm you. I'm about to smell you, I'm you, I'm invited, baby. though. Yeah, no, Jerome's yeah, coming. I'm oh, Jerome's coming, coming as well. So yeah, we're going to be on. Freebie. Perfect. Yeah, free piss, everybody. <laughs> we'll free come beer. down. No, but we're going to do a little podcast on the stage at Old Trafford. Perfect. So you can come and join us for that Beautiful. if you want as well. Um, we've got Kev Brown. We've got Adam Hills. A few people. Four o'clock until five o'clock on that stage outside 
Old Trafford. So uh, that's before we go and have our little freebies, Mark, isn't it? Because we're getting <laughs> fucking loose, I think, in, uh, in one of the suites. Uh, the Warwick Davis suite, I think we're in, aren't we? The Warwick Davis suite. <laughs> apparently he's going to be there as well. <laughs> Is it the Warwick Davis suite? Yeah, apparently it's not. <laughs> anyway, listen, guys, Is thank it? you so much uh, for coming. I don't know, John, I don't know. Uh, you made it up. Yeah, I made it up. All oh, right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, actually, uh, who knows if we're doing George. it next season? We've done it for, what, four four or five years now. It's been it's been, it's been been a good old ride, hasn't it? We've had some great guests on it. And, um, Is this your exit speech no I'm just saying I, pre I appreciate these guys coming down on a random Tuesday night yeah. 823 of them and thank you so much to the guys at Seven Brothers as well the beers have been fantastic go and check them out on the website and um, we will be back next week with the final one of the season you can follow us uh, at Out of Your RL on Twitter um, and we will see you very shortly you little buggers